Welcome back, Straight Talkers. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Allie, and I'm a board-certified psychiatrist. Today, I'm going to react to The Oprah Winfrey Show. And in this episode, Oprah interviews Trudy Chase, a woman with 92 personalities. It's a, it's a difficult show for me to do, but um, I am doing it because I think it is very important that the message get very clear to everyone. This is a story like no other that you will ever hear. Many of the things that you hear today are disgusting and they are graphic. I would appreciate it if you would not write me letters telling me that they should not be said because it is all too true. This small baby girl was born whole but was not allowed to remain safe for very long because at the age of two, Trudy Chase was brutally raped by her stepfather and was continually abused until she ran away at the age of 16. But her nightmare did not end there because as a result of some of the most horrific abuse, and we will not discuss all of it today, but the most horrific things you could ever in your consciousness imagine, uh, Trudy Chase dealt with her pain by splitting into several different personalities. Eventually, all of those personalities, uh, which has been documented, totaled 92 distinct people living within one mind. She calls them her troops. So this is most commonly known as multiple personality disorder, and it's thought to occur in 1-2% to of the population. However, this is old terminology, and it's now referred to as Dissociative Identity Disorder, or DID for short. The name was changed in 1994 because it's thought that the disorder is characterized more by a fragmentation or a breakdown of identity rather than by growth of separate personalities. And many people with this disorder don't use the term personality to describe their identities or personality states. Instead, they use the term alter, which is short for alternate state identities. Another term that gets used instead of alter is parts. Most people typically have more than one alter, and the term used when talking about all the alters collectively is a system. But this terminology isn't consistent among everyone, and as you heard, Trudy refers to her alters as her troops. Welcome Trudy Chase and the troops to the show. Mm. Mm. Well, Um, uh, let, let's start at the beginning, um, although I, I know the story and a lot of you because of um, the, the movie last night and um, what will air tonight are somewhat familiar with the story and perhaps a lot of you have read the book, um, When Rabbit Howls. It all started when you were two. Two. Mm -hmm. um, it was so hard to dredge up those memories, you know, um, I guess when we started out with Dr. Phillips, each one of us would have little flicks. Mm -hmm the troop members, and we had to share them uh, with each other. And some of us had to dig pretty deep mm -hmm. just to get even the tiniest flicks. Mm -hmm. The mind is so kind. So there are two main features that we look for when diagnosing this disorder. The first is a disruption of identity that leads to two or more distinct personality states. And these personality states usually have distinct names identities, temperaments, and self-images. The second feature is the presence of recurrent episodes of dissociative amnesia, meaning that the person struggles with memory gaps and remembering important information about their life and everyday events. When you were two years old, your mother divorced your real father. She didn't really divorce him. She just moved uh, out to a farm with this, um, the man we call the stepfather. Mm -hmm. And from that day forward, we lived with him. The first contact with the stepfather was? Well, it was in the apartment um, of the father and the mother. I guess he was a friend of the father's. Mm -hmm. And he walked in one day and sat down at the kitchen table and put us on his lap. Mm -hmm. And it began. Mm -hmm. I can remember the taste of um, caramel candy in my mouth. And him. Mm -hmm. um, that was fondling. The way the brain works with memory formation is really interesting, especially when it comes to our senses. So our sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Whenever we have sensations, raw sensory data will enter the brain and be categorized and compared to previously stored data and templates. So with familiar patterns, the incoming signals are so repetitive and so well known and so ingrained, your brain will basically ignore them. 
and the brain stress system will not be activated. However, if a familiar pattern occurs out of context or the incoming information is new or strange, the brain will activate a stress response. And this response will then strengthen our memories of the events because the brain works to keep us alive. And this is especially true when extreme emotions, especially negative emotions, are involved. And this is critical for our survival. Our brain wants to recall things that are threatening so that it can avoid these situations in the future. It tries to protect us based upon what it's already learned about the world and our experiences. And of course, when he got it. So he fondled you the very first, your first yeah. memory of him is that he That's was fondling That's the first memory you. that sits in this mind. You know? And so he, he had his shirt open and the hairs. Yeah, and the hand. Um, he just kept So you were a little back. child sitting on his lap. Yeah. And you were playing with the hairs on his chest. Yeah. And he just kept leaning back and the hand went down further and further. And um, we couldn't say the uh, word for penis, I guess, until about two years into therapy. Mm -hmm. Couldn't say the word. Couldn't figure out why. Um, you, d you operate in the world and you don't know that you don't have any memory. Mm -hmm. I didn't have any memory. Couldn't remember the clothes I wore, couldn't remember the teachers, couldn't remember school. Didn't have a picture of the stepfather's uh, face. So this is the selective amnesia that we were talking about earlier. Patients will have recurrent gaps in the recall of everyday events or with important personal information or even traumatic events. And this is at a level that can be too extensive to be explained by ordinary forgetfulness. So your very first recollection, and, and I... I'm saying it just to get to the story of sexual intercourse was when? Um, a two in a uh, field of uh, tall grass. <laughs> uh, tall grass. Ground is, it's springtime, the ground is uh, still wet. And um, see that grass moving over your head. And uh, I don't have all of it. The others have parts of it. The other personality. Yeah, and, and that, which is which is why multiplicity comes into place in the first place. It do you isn't. remember that though? Is do you remember well, the day it happened the first time? We no, we had to. Um, that's what all the therapy was for. Uh, the memory was sitting right on the surface, but nobody could really beam in on it. And uh, then it came. And we dealt with it. So it's been estimated that around ninety percent of those with dissociative identity disorder have experienced childhood abuse and neglect. And it's thought that this disorder is the result of several factors. And there are four questions I always take into consideration when evaluating for this disorder. And these are, one, is there a history of recurrent episodes of severe physical, emotional, or sexual abuse in childhood? Two, what social supports were present during the child's upbringing? Oftentimes what we see is that children have disorganized attachments with caregivers and a lack of good social support. Three, is this someone who has a history of being able to easily dissociate? And what I mean by dissociation is when someone feels disconnected either from themselves or their environment. And it's often described as being like an out-of-body experience. And the fourth question is, is it likely that the patient developed a coping style where the use of splitting helped during the time of distress to where it functioned as a survival skill? What would happen, Trudy, when you were alone in the house? That was the hardest um, to deal with because various ones of us had no memory of ever being alone with him, ever, ever, ever. And uh, when it started to come out, I thought I would go mad. Multiplicity keeps you sane um, under the worst conditions, but I actually thought I was going crazy. That's so interesting, and I say this with all <gasps> respect, because you, you think this is sane? Yeah, this is sane. This is sanity. Mm -hmm. I am sane. We are sane. Mm -hmm. But if it had See, I think the, the idea of having be... 92 different people living inside of you would make me a little crazy. Ah. Uh... Believe it or not, it's easy. It's easier to deal with than the abuse was. Really? Yeah. When our body activates its stress system, there are generally two different paths that a person can take. Some will go into hyperarousal, while others will dissociate. A dissociative response is a very common response when we're talking about extreme stressors. And this is especially true when we're looking at infants and young children. A lot of people are familiar with the concept of fight or flight. 
However, infants and young children who experience abuse aren't able to fight or flee. Think about it, right? They're incapable of running away or they're too slow and they're often too small to win a fight. So with these tactics being unavailable to protect them, the brain protects them by disappearing or dissociating. They disengage from the external world and psychologically flee into their internal world. And this produces a psychological distancing from what's happening to them. What we see is that over time, one's ability to escape into that safe inner world increases and people become better able to dissociate during times of stress. Well, we have heard, those of us who, who do talk shows and read about these kinds of things, that, that you can integrate all of the personalities. And so you have never wanted to be integrated? Uh, we vehemently um, reject the idea, the option. Why? And we know that we have it. Um, because each one of us went through some pretty deep garbage and this is our opportunity, has been our opportunity for a while to explore each other. There are a lot of things we can do out there in this world. Do you know... Do you feel like you lost whoever you would have been the day, that day you were raped at two years old? Well, she is no more. No more. Um, the day we found that out, then I really thought we would go mad. Mm-hmm. Something has to give. You can't dump that much on a human being and not lose something. Isn't that the truth? Some people who study dissociative identity disorder talk about the idea of personality integration. And it's been suggested that everyone starts off with a personality that is not integrated. And your personality becomes integrated somewhere between the ages of like seven to nine years old. Therefore, if you have trauma before that age range, your brain can react by preventing your personality from integrating. And this leads to your personality from being able to fully develop into one singular personality. Now, when it comes to treating dissociative identity disorder, there are no medications that are currently FDA approved. The gold standard of treatment is therapy. And generally, there's a three-pronged approach. The first is to establish safety because there's a high rate of suicidal ideation and self-harm behaviors in those with dissociative identity disorder. I've seen studies that estimated that around 70% of patients who are in the outpatient setting with dissociative identity disorder have attempted suicide. So we really want to ensure safety. Along with safety, we also want to try to stabilize co-occurring symptoms as best as possible. The second approach is identifying and working through past traumas. As Trudy mentions, various of her alters have certain memories of her trauma while others don't. So therapists will often work with patients on tolerating, processing, and integrating those past traumas. Lastly, the third approach is identity integration and rehabilitation. And this is often the patient's choice on whether or not they wish to try merging the separate identities into a singular identity. When did you realize you were not living alone? Um, with who you thought you were? <laughs> heard a voice one day, a tiny little voice, a child's voice. Excuse me, calling out um, the name. And uh, um, she, just calling the name. And I said to myself, my God, I know that I talk to myself, but I'm hearing this voice. What, what is this? And then that stopped, thank God. But shortly after that, like you woke up, one morning and in the bedroom, it was all gritty and gray. And you looked around and they were all there. Except the mind is so kind to you, it only, it gave you the impression of there being only seven. And as we went on in therapy and you realized that the number was grow, 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 growing, um, you said, boy, I must really be crazy. You know, I've got to be a Looney Tune. But there was Dr. Phillips, and thank God he said, this is normal for you. You are, no, no, excuse me, you are normal within your frame of reference. It was like a blessing, and I don't mean to shout, I'm sorry. I don't, ooh, it was a blessing. You are normal within your frame of reference, okay? I'm fine. The altars of those with dissociative identity disorder can demonstrate different affects, behaviors, consciousness memories, perceptions, cognitions, and sensory motor functioning. The term for when an alter is talking, interacting with the world, and controlling one's body is called fronting. 
It has been described that when one has a strong internal communication within their system of alters, that can give the individual good control of who's fronting. However, some systems have poor communication, which results in little control over which alter is present. Now, if you enjoyed this video, make sure to hit that subscribe button and click the top video to see another psychiatrist reacts.